product for all kinds of vehicles. With manufacturing facilities in over 100 countries and production under several brands, meet the man in charge of India's massive tyre manufacturing company. Neeraj Kanwar, the creator of a multinational brand, Apollo Tyres. He is often referred to as a disruptor of the global tyre market. Mr. Kanwar has a keen eye for high performance quality and luxury. Welcome to Billion Dollar Idea. I'm Jasper Reed, and I'm joined today by Neeraj Kanwa, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Apollo Tyres. Welcome, Neeraj. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Um, we're delighted to have you here. Your reputation precedes you. And as a man that um, has quadrupled the, uh, the size and worth of, of your enterprise, um, it provides a fantastic inspiration for those who want to follow in your path. But just to get started here, Neeraj, just, just kind of take us back to, let's say, when you, were, when you were a younger man and when all this started. Did you want to get into this world? Or we know that you're a great tennis guy and swimming guy. Would you, would you have rather swum at the Olympics? <laughs> Not really. Uh, no, I think, you know, I grew up in a business entrepreneur family, uh, started by my uh, late uh, grandfather. And then came my father, who was already into the business of manufacturing. Uh, and uh, from childhood, I wanted to get into engineering uh, because I liked the idea of uh, equipment, machines, playing with them. And therefore, I did my graduation in engineering, in industrial engineering in uh, the U.S. at Lehigh uh, University. And I did a lot of training in my summer uh, months when people were on vacation. I actually did go and work on the shop floors of our Kerala plant. Uh, which was our main mother plant. So actually, I've you know really grown up in a very entrepreneurial family uh, where people are seen doing businesses, taking risks at the same time. Uh, so it was already already ingrained in me uh, to go in this direction. And Neeraj, just in terms of the evolution of, of the group, at some point in its history, there was a brainwave to move from the, the original foundation into you know, one of the world's most um, universal products being, being tyres. Tell us a little about how that came about and, and was, it, was it a brainwave, was it a natural evolution? Uh, I think it was a natural evolution because at that time, India uh, uh, had, uh, it was a closed economy and uh, India gave out licences to uh, entrepreneurs to make different products. And at that time, I think my grandfather and father were there at the right time, right place. They got the license for starting a tire uh, facility in Kerala, given that Kerala is the fourth largest uh, state in the world producing natural rubber. And um, the government wanted to promote tires and uh, labor, uh, thereby using the natural rubber in Kerala. And so, therefore, that really came into our lap. Uh, in 1974 uh, and started that uh, first facility in Kerala. We know um, in, in the context of Indian Neeraj that the diversified family groups are often foraying into other areas of, of another business sectors. Has that been a temptation for your group to move out of the core business into other areas? Well, you know, Jasmine, in the beginning, uh, yes, uh, my grandfather had various businesses. Uh, uh, and But uh, over time, uh, this company was really down and out. It was bankrupt uh, in the uh, late 70s, uh, Apollo Tires. And my father then came in, took over this company in 78, 79. And then he only requested his father that uh, to give him pure independency and uh, pure focus to the tire business so that he could take it to a different level. So with that, I think the entire focus of my father and his team then was really to make uh, uh, Apollo known in the Indian tire market. Uh, at that time, we had international competition, we had domestic competition. Now I'm going back in the 80s. Uh, they didn't have technology in the tire company. We had a tire with an American company called General Tire, but those tires were really good for American roads and not for Indian roads. So, really, uh, Mr. Kanwar uh, sat down, made his uh, technology team. Uh, some of them are still with us in the company who really came up with new tires for the Indian roads. And then he and his team really focused on the tire business to make it a success. So there was, uh, I would say, no uh, diversification as far as Apollo tires 
and Mr. Kanwar and his team were concerned. And Neeraj, just staying on the core business, the tyre business, as you say, you established a position in, on, the, on the subcontinent. What was the original impetus for the international expansion? And, and, and most specifically to you, what were the learnings along the way as you moved from the Netherlands to Hungary to South Africa? W w tell us a bit about that story. Well, you know, uh, we were very focused. I joined the business in 1995. And at that time, we were only India and we were only truck tires. Truck tires at that time were 80% of the Indian tire revenue market. And so I think at that point, Mr. Kanwa had decided we want to be the leaders in the truck tire because that was 80% of the pie. Um, when I came in, obviously, I went through the normal training process. In 2004 is when we actually went to the hill stations in India, to Shimla, and we had a brainstorming session with myself and my core team. We were like 15, 16 of us, young guys, dynamic uh, innovative, wanted to go to a different level. And at that point, we were a mere $350 million company uh, with a single product um, and a single market. And that team, uh, with me being there, we set out our next course, which was the next five years, uh, and what the vision would be. And really came out with a vision of becoming a $2 billion company by the year 2010. Um, it went off well because it was... 2010 by 2010 was our slogan at that point in time. And really what we needed to get to the 2 billion mark was not only India, we had to venture out to new uh, countries in the world uh, and to de-risk ourselves from being a really uh, one country centric uh, uh, company. And as you know, India has its uh, ups and downs and therefore de-risking became a very important part. The second part was very important to us was R&D and putting a lot of emphasis behind technology. Because if we had to go outside of India, we needed international global technology, global quality. So that became a very key pillar for us in the organization. And the third most key pillar was building a brand uh, and, and uh, really going into a global brand uh, kind of a story so that you could you would know, be known in the outside market. Uh, so really, when we set out uh, on, on these three parameters on taking the company to the next level, uh, a lot of training happened as far as R&D is concerned. A lot of collaboration with international universities happened and domestic uh, rubber institutes happened, uh, whereby we started uh, training our people. We started hiring a lot of R&D technologists. I remember at that point, we were less than a 0.5% of R&D spends uh, to sales. Today, we are at a two and a half times. So slowly, slowly, gradually, we've been uh, putting a lot of investments behind research and, and development. In 2006, this opportunity came, us, uh, came to our lab from South Africa, which was a company called Dunlop Tires. Uh, and they had their manufacturing facilities in Durban and in uh, Ladysmith. And that was a new, uh, I would say, an era for Apollo to go outside of its comfort zone, which was India. Uh, learned a lot from South Africa because there was a cultural integration piece there. There was a new country altogether. So I really led that uh, MA opportunity. And we had a lot of Indians, expats go into South Africa, uh, uh, specifically on the shop floor on the engineering side, because that's where the Knowledge Bank of India is. Uh, and then came up the opportunity to go into Europe. And for us, Europe was very, very important, given the two pillars that I mentioned to you about R&D and building a brand. Because if you can get a tire to be made and run on a German road, like you know, high speeds, winter tires, snow, rain, all types of weathers are on the German uh, roads and the German customers are very, very demanding. Uh, if you can get a tire uh, which is proven on those roads, then you have really come up in technology. And then Europe carpool itself is the highest uh, profit margin carpool in the world, uh, given the high level of cars, given the different uh, ultra high performance tires that you need over there, uh, obviously the margins uh, expansion is in Europe. So there was a desire to get into Europe uh, somehow, and then came up with this uh, acquisition of Fredestein in 2009. And Fredestein at that point is was a very high niche player in the car segment. So they were only uh, looking at winter tires for the ultra high performance cars. And therefore that gave us a opportunity to enter into the European market. Uh, and that point in time, we did look at three or four East European countries, 
uh, and Hungary were shortlisted um, just primarily because of the government was very positive. It was really a one window clearance uh, and we've never looked back. So we started operations in uh, just outside Budapest in 2017. And today we have a family of nearly 1,200 people in uh, Hungary. So that's really a, in a short span uh, uh, the story, the journey of globalizing our poor. And it's an astonishing and, and um, impressive story, Niraj. That I mean, it will, you make it sound very easy, but if you if you go back and you think about the core of this story, and I'm interested in you, I'm interested in the motivation behind this. It's one thing to set the two billion dollar target. It's it's another thing to have the will to to execute it. So I'm interested in what the motivation is. is. Is it shareholder return? Is it take over the world? Is it to be the biggest? When you and that young team came together in Shimla, what it, what's, what's really been the secret of what drives this? Well, I think a lot goes to uh, my father, who's given me, uh, one, a lot of independence to drive it. Uh, he himself uh, is a, a very ambitious uh, driver, uh, a visionary, and he's been pushing us to go to the next level. And I'm very happy to say that the team that we were surrounded with, we all had the same uh, motivation to go and take this company to a different level. Uh, it was just not uh, by uh, producing tires and dumping all over the world. It was to create a brand and create a technology and create an institution of people and family around us uh, all over the world, which had the same motivation and the same drive. And that drive was really the passion that came in was to take this brand Apollo to a different level and known in, in the international markets. And do you, do you Neeraj, within that, that's totally understood. Is there, is there a bigger purpose beyond this? I mean, if you, as, as a person, if you look in the mirror any day and say, why am I doing this? Do you have an answer for that? Well, you know, it's just, uh, uh, Jasper, it's just the pure passion that comes out from inside to say that you have achieved something in life. And once you achieve that, then you want to go again another step to say, okay, now well, how do I make another difference uh, to the company? Because now you are looking after 19,000 families and they all are looking up to you that what's the next step for them. Even during this pandemic, uh, I think Apollo team has done a great job by all of us uh, coming together and running for the same cause. And the same cause was first, look after the safety of our people all across the world. And second is to go back to performances of what uh, is unachievable. And we normally, the culture of the organization is that we do set ourselves challenging targets. And that really gives us drive every morning to see how we're gonna get there. Uh, and what are the hurdles that we're gonna face. So really it's the drive and the motivation. And after all, if you have a leader who's a visionary, he does wake you up every morning and says, what's happening? <laughs> so <laughs> you need someone in the back to always push you. That's right. Whether you're in London or Delhi, there's always, there's always your father waking you up in the morning. It's a virtual world now. <laughs> and and Nero, it's just coming to you and, and the way you manage and the way you interact with people. You're known as an exceptionally personable man, and, and uh, I'm certainly enjoying the conversation. But what, um, how's that developed? Were you always like this? Have you had to learn those skills? Are you better at those skills? I uh, know I never had to learn that. I just came from inside. I think if you uh, uh, enjoy working where you are working and you're not seeing it as a hardship and you're actually seeing it as a fun place, and my mantra has always been work hard but even play harder. And that's what I believe in. And that's why this small company of ours, this small family of ours is always working hard, but we still joke around, we still have fun. We still, when COVID was not there, we do get together once a month somewhere in the world and two, three days of uh, hard work, but the evenings are full of fun and uh, enjoying each other. Um, and I think my father is also, the basic value that he has inculcated on all of us is the uh, Apollo One family value, which is that we all, these 19,000 people are working for one cause and that's for all of us, we are one family and then we have our own immediate families who we, we are working for. So really fun at work is something which is my philosophy and it just comes within. Uh, I'm not a serious type of a guy, but yeah, work has to be done. But then even on virtual meetings, we are having fun. It's not that uh, you have a one hour slot and you're just going boom, boom, boom. You just, you do play jokes, you do have fun and then and that's that's life and you make it a, a little bit relaxed for everyone. And that really helped us in the pandemic. If 
I or my father or the leaders of the organization had shown crisis uh, to the entire team, then we wouldn't have done what we've done in the first nine months. So I believe in transparent communication because that gets the best out of the whole organization. If it's only a one-way street, then it doesn't happen. You have to have a two-way street with it. There is open communication and you take that dialogue to a different level and you act on it. That's incredibly helpful for, for aspiring and, and, and budding entrepreneurs, Niraj. Just, just turning our attention back to the original market, the home market, accepting that you're, you know, you're now a proper international business. Do you think being an entrepreneur, let's say, Niraj, in India is any harder or easier than anywhere else? Do you think that being an entrepreneur in India makes it easier to be an entrepreneur elsewhere? You, you, you're, a, you're an interesting man to talk to on that front. Well, I think uh, each, it's not where you are. It's uh, the entrepreneur spirit has to be within you. Uh, yes, India does um, give you a whole host of opportunities uh, because it's a growing economy. Uh, unlike uh, developed countries like UK or the US or Europe for that matter. But if you have that entrepreneur spirit in you and you're willing to take the risk, uh, you have the appetite to take the risk, uh, you will fail. And you should never be scared of failure because failure will only teach you on how to bec become successful. Uh, and that's my mantra to all my employees that, guys, come on, we will take that risk. Um, eight out of ten risks may fail. But the ninth and the tenth one, if it's successful, it will give you a different level of satisfaction. My philosophy to the organization has been, what is the Apollo culture? And the Apollo culture is this Apollo One family that I keep talking about, and the culture of being transparent and communicative with everyone in the organization. So that's very, very key uh, to, according to me, to a successful uh, entrepreneur. I think that's, in, again, that's incredibly helpful, Niraj. This is a hugely upbeat and, and optimistic story, which, which we'd, we'd expect it to be because you've enjoyed enormous success. But Niraj, what is it that, that possibly keeps you, keeps you awake at night? What, what are the things that you fear? You must have fears of some sort. I think there are sleepless nights that uh, I, uh, firstly, I don't have sleepless nights. I have a good night. Uh, but in the morning, I get the energy back up to, uh, so I do my gym in the morning very early at 6.30 to 9. That gives me a lot of thoughts in the gym. Uh, if I was to pinpoint on any sleepless nights, I would just say uh, failure of a new venture that I've gone into within the company. Uh, whether I, the, the biggest challenge, and you can understand that just coming from India, moving to the UK, and why UK? Because I had to oversee uh, a new company, a new uh, European uh, group that we had taken over. And then setting ourselves into Hungary, where we didn't know anything. We didn't know the language. We didn't know the culture. Uh, none of us had any experience in Hungary. was in itself a challenge. And those days I used to have sleepless nights because to set up a green field in a, non, uh, uh, in a new land, uh, which is spanning 200,000 square meters of, uh, of covered uh, area is a challenging task. And I still remember in the months of 2016 in December, um, we had snow in Hungary in the factory. We didn't have heating because it was still civil buildings were coming up. And I had a bunch of 100, 150 uh, Indians from South India who had never experienced snow. And that in itself was a challenge because going from a 45 degrees to a minus 10 degrees uh, for this culture was very, very difficult. But hats off to the team. They went up, they put it up, and everything now we look back. So really, I, I, I'm a great believer that one should have a proper sleep and then think about uh, your challenges the next morning. My father's always taught me one thing, and he's always said this to a lot of us, our team members, is that when you're at work, worry about work. And when you're at home, then worry about home. Don't take work back home and don't get home back to the workplace. And that's how you enjoy your work life and you'll enjoy your uh, family life. And, and would, you, would your wife and children say that you were able to make that seamless transition? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes and no. Uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, once I'm home, I do switch off uh, from work, totally. But yeah, they are one of those odd days when you have to get to work. So yeah. for me, 
Yeah, and I think it's very important also to have a good quality, uh, balanced life between family and work, and especially for entrepreneurs because they'll be going in a new direction. Some of them may be bachelors, but some may not be and have family. And I think it's very important to have that work-life balance is very, very important when you are really starting off on business. Yes, you have to give in your best to the business, but at the same time, if you have a new family, then you need to give time to the family also. Yeah. And just, just staying on those kind of extracurricular activities, Niraj, we know you're a great tennis player and, and in, enjoy swimming and all of that. Um, who are your, just, I'm interested in, in this, who are your heroes out there? Who, who are the, you know, if you, weren't, if you weren't running a global tire business, who would you want to be? <laughs> well, uh, no, I don't want to be, I don't have anyone like that, but I would say tennis, I used to be very good, then I broke my knee while doing a skiing, uh, I had a skiing accident, so tennis really went down, but I did go to a lot of um, Wimbledon finals and um, Roger Federer was my favorite. I used to take my son to the Wimbledon finals, so I've seen all those five-hour matches between Roger Federer and Nadal and Djokovic. So that is uh, very interesting. Uh, something that I really like to do is I've been trying to fly. And uh, since childhood, I have always wanted to go in the aviation uh, industry and become a pilot. But uh, first, my parents didn't allow me. Now my wife doesn't allow me because of danger and safety. So I started doing a lot of simulation of, uh, of flying. And recently, I just bought a, a, a very fancy 737, Boeing 737 flight simulator which is a whole cockpit, and I'm learning how to fly on that. So that's really my passion. It gives me a good two, three hours of quietness, and I do what I have to do in that small simulator. I, su I, suppose, I suppose now that you've got the simulator, Niraj, you could, um, you could start to diversify by acquiring Air India. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that'd be the last on my list. And just Niraj, telling, I know this week you've been very involved in Davos, and and you're a you're a you're a big player there. When you talk to your your son who's starting out himself, or any of the generation, and you reflect upon, you know, the next cycle, the economic cycle globally, having seen, you know, several cycles yourself, are you are you bullish? What are your what are, what are, what are your kind of forecasts? Well, uh, as uh, I like to cut it up into India and Europe, um, India I'm very bullish about. In fact, just before this, I heard um, Prime Minister Modi speak to us in Davos. Uh, we had a virtual meeting with him. And, you know, when he speaks, it gives you a lot of motivation and inspiration of all that the Indian government has done and how well they have handled uh, COVID-19. And surprisingly, and he also said this, that in the beginning in March, People said that India is the highest risk for COVID and uh, this is a bomb to be blasted. When COVID will come in, they will not know what to do. But the way India and the government and under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, they've handled it, has been uh, clearly one of the most successful stories in the world. Because if you see UK uh, being such a small population compared to India, we are having many more cases over here than in India. Uh, the second thing that he said that as an entrepreneur spirit, we were first buying gloves and PPE from the rest of the world. And then he started this uh, journey. Today, we are not only making for the domestic market in India, but we are supplying to the rest of the world all gloves and PPE and masks. And then the third thing is the vaccines. Uh, this is a very bullish story, and we are seeing it on the ground. As far as Apollo is concerned, we see the economy moving first because it's got to do with trucks. If trucks are not moving, that means tires are not selling. And if trucks are not moving, goods are not moving. People are not buying. But today, if you're able to produce tires, uh, they, uh, you will be able to sell them because the truck movement is so huge given the government involvement in mining, in infrastructure, in building the whole country, there's huge consumer demand. And so I'm pretty bullish about uh, India. Secondly, when I turn into Europe, uh, given the COVID-19 situation that's come back into Europe, has slowed down the economy. Uh, uh, tra uh, cars are traveling less, obviously, because people are not going out. Uh, so tire sales are low. Uh, we've had a very bad winter uh, or a delayed winter. Uh, and, and therefore, the winter tire market was 
uh, very bad uh, this year. Uh, but again, I'm bullish going forward because the investments that Apollo has made in the Ferristein brand, um, where we are only targeting the higher end of the market. So something we call ultra high performance or ultra ultra high performance tires is what we are looking at. And that's where Ferristein is gaining market share in, in, in Europe. Uh, so I'm Okay, I'm. Uh, I, I won't say I'm as optimistic as I am for India, uh, but Europe gives us an opportunity. We being a small niche player in this continent. Okay, and last last couple of questions, Niraj. First one, obvious one. Two pieces of advice for the budding entrepreneur. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you have to take a risk. Uh, do not shy away from failures. Uh, there is success at the end of the tunnel, but please remain focused on what you're doing. Don't try and go every avenue. If you've taken on one avenue, then please put, put in all your effort and focus in that direction. And, and last, last question, Niraj. I mean, you're a, you're, you're a young man. Your father's still waking you up in the morning. So this is not a eulogy in any way. But how do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered when you're at the summit or halfway up the hill looking back? What do you want people to say? Well, I, um, he was a fun guy. And he created a brand which was uh, a global brand coming from India. And that's the vision that we have in the company in any case. Well, you're doing pretty well so far, sir. Neeraj Kamar, thank you very much for joining us on, on Billion Dollar Idea. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.